everyone should just see a really obnoxiously sized logo for the Canson Farm North Environment Centre. I'm getting a thumbs up. Great. Thank you. Um, so as um, Praj said, my name is Lucy and I'm the director here at the Canson Farm North Environment Centre, which is the hat I'm wearing today for this presentation. Um, and I also want to start by acknowledging um, that wherever we're calling in from, um, we're calling in from stolen lands of First Nations people. Um, in uh, At Kafnek, we work from Cardwell to the Torres Strait and west to the border, which I always like to remind everyone it's like twice the size of Victoria, um, which, you know, highlights how big Queensland is as well. Um, and in that region, we have an incredible number of different traditional owner groups, um, but and all across Queensland, you know, we have incredible First Nations people who are really um, powerful um, advocates for country um, and are doing incredible work all over our state. Uh, and it's a privilege to work alongside people who um, for so long have been stewards of um this amazing place we call home and today I'm calling in from the lands of the Gimoy, Wallaburra, Yudindji and Yurikanji peoples and I'd like to pay my own respects to their elders past and present and to all of those people uh, across Queensland and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who might be on the call today. Um, so I'm going to run through a bit of a presentation. Uh, I can see some familiar faces on the call tonight, um, so some of this won't be news to you, uh, and maybe for some it is, um, and really happy to do my best to answer, yeah, any questions that I think I can answer um, at the end. So I'll just get started. Um, so I'm actually going to start um, with this video because I think... Um, this is a, the state of the climate report from 2020. And so even though it's four years out of date, it's actually a very good way of describing why this conversation we're having is important and why emissions reduction and the transition to renewable energy is important. So I'm just going to start by letting the experts from the Bureau of Meteorology remind us of why this conversation is important. Our climate shapes the lives of all Australians. So how is our climate changing and why. Despite some slowdown during COVID-19, global carbon dioxide concentrations are now higher than any time in the last two million years. The enhanced greenhouse effect is a major driver of our changing climate. Australia's temperatures continue to rise with more frequent and intense heat waves. These trends are projected to continue the number of dangerous fire weather days is increasing, with longer fire seasons for the east and south of the country. Over time, long-term rainfall patterns have shifted. The southern half of Australia is becoming drier during the cooler months, and combined with warming temperatures, there will be more time spent in severe drought. In contrast, Wet season rainfall over central and northern parts has increased. The oceans are absorbing some of the additional carbon emitted by humans. As this happens, they are acidifying. Ocean temperatures continue to increase and marine heat waves are becoming more frequent and severe. As a result of the warming oceans, sea levels are rising and the rate of increase is accelerating. Looking ahead, all these trends are projected to continue. So reducing global emissions will lead to less warming and impacts. With better science than ever before, State of the Climate can help Australians better plan and adapt for our changing climate. So if you haven't engaged with the Bureau of Meteorology's um, State of the Climate reports, they're really um, important and sobering <laughs> updates that we get each year about the state of our climate. I think the 2021 did a really good job at just like visually summarising what we're facing. And, you know, since then, you know, we have um, in, in our region um, and all across Australia seen increasing impacts of, um, you know, climate change and, and, and in front of Queensland, you know, in my region, we just had what, what's been described as a one in 2000 year event um, the flooding that we've, that's just occurred here has completely rearranged the wet tropics um, landscape and is likely to have caused some local extinctions. So, um, you know, there's some really serious climate 
you know, um, issues that we're facing. Um, and the drivers of those are really clear. So this is just a little bit of um, information around, you know, um, I, I guess the the targets that we've set, uh, where we're headed. And so you can and see at the moment, like um, we're heading for 2.7 degrees of warming, which um, means we would lose the reef. We lose, we lose is um, the Great Barrier Reef at uh, anything above 1.5, uh, the wet tropics, rainforests, Gondwanan uh, in similar scenarios. Um, so, you know, we're really looking at um, losing some really uh, world-renowned values, but also, you know, the impacts to human well-being, like heat waves, um, cyclones, flooding, fires will all continue to increase. You can see, um, you know, we know that climbing, climate damaging emissions are one of the key drivers of climate change, art is the key driver of climate change. Um, and in 2019, um, the assessment showed that 32% of those climate damaging emissions in Australia were coming from our electricity um, system. Um, not to, you know, uh, sort of ignore that there's still stationary energy, transport, um, you know, and, you know, some other major sectors there that are contributing. So um, our energy transition is one part of how we tackle climate damaging emissions, but is one of the most important parts because it's the most contributing factor um, to our emissions. So it's really important to keep in mind why the um, why we need to change our current energy system and that so much of that comes from our electricity market. Um, but and the energy system, though, has more issues than just climate damaging emissions. And this is where we get into the complexity of tonight's conversation is that, you know, um, when we look at what's causing climate damaging emissions, energy and electricity is the major contributor. But there's other issues that are associated with the electricity and energy sector um, that are really important issues. And uh, and this transition is not just an opportunity to address climate damaging emissions associated with our energy industry, but also the other things that I've listed there, biodiversity loss, land sovereignty for First Nations people, energy poverty. You know, um, if you if, when I talk about energy poverty, what I'm talking about is the fact that in our remote Aboriginal communities, we still have people who are on energy cards, which means you get like a credit card where you can go to the shop and put credit on a card and then you put that in your energy meter and if that runs out and the shop's closed then you have to wait until you have more money or something to put on that card to go and get electricity the pure admin of that is probably beyond most of us let alone access to the to money to do that um but it also looks like um affordability uh of energy as well so not just access but affordability um and then there's also the fact that, you know, a lot of our, there's a lot of communities who don't have access to the grid who are on diesel generation and not on, you know, um, reliable energy um, systems. And energy and democracy is also, you know, sort of in, integrating all of these things, but it's really talking about um, addressing the, you know, structural ba societal barriers to energy, you know, security. So, you know, what socioeconomic um, determinants are really preventing people from uh, accessing energy and having energy. So some of the, um, you know, other things that sort of some of the news reports there is, you know, like we associated with an energy transition, we have, and I'll talk about this more later, an expansion of critical mineral mining. And so, you know, silica sand is really is required for the production of solar panels, but it's also on a lot of Indigenous country and really pristine areas where people don't want to necessarily lose their landscapes to mining. Um, we also have so many, um, like, uh, contamination issues with, um, like critical mineral mines and also fossil fuel mines um, with tailings and wastewater and, you know, all of the kind of uh, impacts that those um, those mines have across our country. So, you know, I'm just, I guess, starting this conversation by saying we can transition to renewable energy and solve our emissions issue, but it would be a very large missed opportunity if we didn't also tackle 
people these other issues associated with the energy industry that have such an incredible impact on our environment and our regional communities particularly. Um, and I guess I just wanted to, in the introduction, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, wicked problems. Uh, and wicked problems is not a, a concept that everyone's come across, uh, but it's used to describe really um, nuanced problems <laughs> that are of a scale that no one country or group of people can address. Um, so like climate, the climate crisis, like the biodiversity crisis, you know, like poverty, um, these are considered wicked problems and you can see the little circles around the outside are uh, um, the elements of what a wicked problem is. And I think some of the things that I wanted to uplift is that, um, you know, problems are never completely solved. We can problems often have perverse outcomes. So it's not clear what um, problems you're going to cause in trying to solve the problem that you're addressing. Um, there's not really a one easy and clear definition of what the issue is. So like if you talk about climate change, are you talking about biodiversity loss? Are you talking about climate damaging emissions? Are you talking about the impacts of people's human rights? Are you talking what, are, you know, there's so many different ways that you can talk about climate change as a problem. Um, and the reason um, that we get caught up, I think, a lot in the urgency and the justice sort of um, I guess debate in in the energy transition is and and it's like we we've come so late to the transition that we just have to do it and at all costs because if we don't we're going to lose anything everything um and other people saying no we've got to stop the transition until we know exactly what we're doing so that we don't um make repeat the same problems of the past um and I think that the reality is that we have to sit somewhere in the middle that, 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 that uh, like we, we can transition now if we do it well. And, you know, I put a, a quote from Albert Einstein there is like, because I think particularly from our governments and our industry at the moment is they're using the same thinking that they use to create the fossil fuel energy industry to try and create, um, you know, the the new renewable energy industry, which is talking about a grid system, a large scale system, not talking enough about um, efficiency, not talking about enough about distributed um, energy systems and small scale energy systems and energy justice, which I'll talk a little bit more about tonight. Um, but I think it's always important to come back to the fact that this is a wicked problem. And so we're not going to find a solution that doesn't have perverse outcomes and doesn't have um, impacts beyond our control um, and if we try and pursue a solution that looks like that we're probably just pretending that those perverse impacts don't exist. Um, we've often all heard of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change or the IPCC but um, one of the things that does exist that not many of us have heard about is that is IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services which is really focused on addressing the biodiversity crisis that we have to deal with alongside the climate crisis. And both of these are really interlinked. Um, and I think we all know about this, but sometimes we don't think about it as in the scale that we think about the climate crisis um, because we can feel the impacts of the climate crisis as humans through the fires and the floods and the heat waves, um, but we don't necessarily feel the everyday impacts of the ongoing loss of species and um, extinctions, unless we're like really, really passionate um, wildlife people, which many of us are, um, and, and probably many on the people on this call actually do feel the real emotional impact of losing some of our really iconic species. But also, you know, there's um, a lot of ecosystem services lost, which really impact our ability to exist on the planet. And, you know, there is an economic impact of of biodiversity loss as well. Um, so I'm going to do a quick summary of like my best um, introduction of how these two crises interlink. Um, and some of you have seen this before, so bear with me. So we have climate damaging emissions and biodiversity loss as two of the really big crises that we're trying to address globally at the moment. Um, and both of these uh, crises have, you know, health and livability impacts. They have um, reduced sequestration, species extinction, and increasing temperatures and loss of ecosystem services. And these, these things kind of have a positive feedback 
loop where they, you know, are reinforcing each other and, and causing each other in different ways. Um, and the two big ways globally that we're trying to address these two crises is through biodiversity conservation and emissions reductions. And they're, um, you know, that can look like a lot of different things, but in Australia for the emissions reduction, the key focus is a rapid development of renewable energy and a transition away from fossil fuels. And in biodiversity conservation, it's protecting essential habitat, expanding our protected areas and progressing species conservation and recovery, um, you know, and, and that actually has quite a broad reach. Um, and that's often now, you know, threatened species conservation, our recovery plans and all, all of that kind of work. Um, and unfortunately, these are often dealt with in silos um, at an international level, the IPBES and the IPPC only met for the first time in 2021, which is really wild that at an international level, we're not really talking about these things um, together until 2021. Um, but, you know, at a, at a, um, at a Australian government and state government level, these are also generally dealt with in sort of silos of each other. Um, but they do have, you know, there are very, interconnected because biodiversity, sequestration of carbon and ecosystem function and blue carbon, we need biodiversity for that. Um, but also if we don't, you know, reduce our emissions, we will lose our biodiversity. And so this is like this feedback loop that keeps coming around. And what we're seeing now is that our key uh, mitigation, like renewable energy development is increasing biodiversity loss and um, biodiversity loss is increasing, you know, um, climate impacts. So there's this whole big feedback loop happening. Um, and, you know, when we talk about systems approaches, that's about not siloing these different issues and, and, and making sure that we're talking about these things and addressing these things um, together. But um, I did also want to say that Renewable energy development isn't the driving cause of biodiversity loss in the world, you know. Um, so it is a really important thing, and I'm going to talk about why in a moment. Um, but, you know, like the the thing that's driving um, clearing, biodiversity loss and broad-scale clearing are not the same thing. They're different. The, th the main driver of land clearing in Queensland is um, attributed to uh, grazing. Um, and that's around the land and sea use change. So um, in, and I'll go to another slide in a minute, but, um, you know, I think we just always need to approach these things with the reality of, of what is driving the cause, like as in, a, in Australia, electricity is the cause, the biggest cause of climate damaging emissions, land use and, um, and agriculture is the biggest cause of land clearing. And so I really wanted to make a distinction around how is renewable energy progressing biodiversity loss? And so you can see um, from the, uh, if you haven't heard of SLATS, it's a statewide land and tree uh, report that the Queensland government does and uh, always out of date with. Um, so the last reporting period is 20 to 21. Um, you can see that pasture grazing is like, a, a huge, very accountable for the major land clearing in Queensland. But that's different to biodiversity loss in some ways. So it is biodiversity loss, but it's different to the biodiversity loss we're seeing associated with renewable energy development. And the distinction there is that um, the problematic impacts that we're seeing around um, renewable energy development is really associated with a lot of the development in our highland areas and particularly on the Great Dividing Range, um, where we have a lot of really important um, threatened species habitat. We also have climate refugia. If you haven't come across climate refugia, what's happening at the moment is our species who are adapted to lower temperatures are uh, uh, as our, our global temperatures increase, they're moving higher up these hill slopes to be able to exist in lower temperatures, which exist at higher altitudes. And so our hilltops and mountaintops are becoming really important places that um, certain threatened species can continue to survive. Um, so the way that renewable energy development is increasing biodiversity not loss is not through broad-scale clearing. Um, certainly 
uh, it is agriculture that is continuing to be the main driver of large-scale clearing. But what we are seeing is it's increasing fragmentation of threatened species habitat. It's increasing um, loss of connectivity. It's impacting buffer zones and increasing edge effects. So um, you can see a little bit of you know, uh, a description of what edge and effects and fragmentation is, is basically, um, you know, predator, like the more edges you have of a sort of continuous um, bit of, of um, biodiversity or like forest, um, you know, the more edges there are, the more impacts there are coming around all those edges. So if we start breaking up all those bits of biodiversity by interspersing development through them, then the effects around the edges increase. And, and the same thing for, you know, you might have, for example, species like cassowaries, which are highly um, territorial, you know, and they don't like to share their, their bit of land. And so when, when if you want to have a thriving population of cassowaries, you have to have more connected um, habitat so that those, you know, they can breed and spread and have their own place. Um, crocs are kind of like that too. Um, and there's a lot of different species like that. So, um I think it's really be important to recognise that although, you know, renewable energy development isn't driving broad scale land clearing, it is having impacts to biodiversity that we think we we should be avoiding wherever possible. Um, I also wanted to talk about critical mineral mining uh, associated with renewable energy development, and this is a very brief slide for an incredibly complex issue that I could do a whole nother talk on. So I'm just going to sort of mention it um, in the most concise way I can. Up here at the top, we have um, sort of what is happening at the moment, which is we mine for critical minerals, we manufacture them, they come into the construction of renewable energy, and then we decommission them and they go to blank space. There's not really any where that goes. We don't have any recycling facility. Well, I think there's one solar panel recycling facility now in South Australia. Um, but we don't have a good industry for, for that. And, and what we really need to do is, um, you know, if we at the moment what Australia has is um, basically a plan of exponential growth for critical mineral mining. We've signed an agreement to augment the United States um, supply of critical minerals so that not only will we be supplying critical minerals for our transition but also for their transition. Um, and so it sort of creates an export market for critical minerals that didn't previously exist, which will increase the pressure for critical mineral mining, not just for our transition but for transitions elsewhere. And so what we really want to be doing is moving to a place where we can peak critical mineral mining. And, and that means that we're setting up industries that we can, you know, unlike fossil fuels, once you burn fossil fuels, you can't bring them back into the system. But critical minerals that are used to create solar panels and, you know, um, turbines and other things can be brought back into the system. It's not easy and there's there's impacts associated with it. And, you know, um, but we do, but it, instead of, um, you know, having a plan for exponential growth of critical mineral mining, we need to be really focusing a plan on how we create a donut economy or a closed system for that critical mineral mining, which is not easy and it's hard, but it can be done. Um, but there's a lot of people who stand to profit from ensuring that that doesn't happen because there's a lot of money to be made from critical mineral mining in Australia. So, um, you know, there's some really big players who, who don't want us to have that conversation. Um, I just want to do a bit of a plug uh, for this book because I think if you really if you really want to understand um, the transition as a justice issue, uh, Revolutionary Power by Shalanda Baker is a really important book. It is US based, so it's really based on their transition. But you know, I think we're coming late to the transition, so let's learn the lessons of the other places that are doing this. Um, and I think you know. The thing that I really like about this book is it, it it sort of demonstrates that, you know, this she says that the transition to renewable energy is the biggest opportunity for civil rights that we have in the modern era because it is regional and poverty-stricken communities that are going to host the transition. So it's our opportunity to ensure that those communities are the ones who are being uplifted um, out of these sort of um, 
whether it's like energy poverty or other forms of poverty, you know, in this transition. Um, and what we saw recently was the dire review, and I'll talk about that in a moment, talking about the community engagement or lack thereof, you know, and the community benefit schemes that, you know, really need to be improved. Um, but, um, you know, for a long time it is regional and poverty-stricken communities who have been suffering uh, the ills of the um, current energy system and we want to make sure that that's not repeated, as I said earlier. There's a really incredible paper that I've referenced um, there for those academics um, in the world that talks about the energy justice circle. And I guess I really wanted to lift this up because that that's what we sort of look at as the opportunity in this transition, you know, if we were to do it well, is to look at that whole of systems approach, look at what rights are and look what justice is because they are unique in their own ways and talk about the whole of system approach from extraction and production to operation, consumption, decommissioning. Um, I've listed a lot of the issues that are associated with the current energy system um, and this paper talks about the interventions that need to be made at all um, sort of levels of that system. And if you look at the, you know, Queensland Energy Jobs Plan, the regional partnership framework broadly talks about this, but it doesn't detail it. Um, we're not seeing reporting on it and we're not seeing legislation on it. So, you know, what we're seeing is legislation on the on the large scale elements of, of this transition, but we're not seeing anyone accountable uh, to the social justice and environmental justice elements of this transition, which is something that we've been really pushing for. Um, our policy context is really depressing. I think I, I did an interview recently with the uh, with the Guardian, and and you know the reporter asked me, you know, what what would you say to reassure the community um, that this transition, you know, is is going to happen in a way that respects the environment and the and communities? And I was like, well, I wouldn't reassure anyone of that, and I would say that if you want, if this, you know, this needs to happen well, you everyone needs to be having an opinion about how to do that um, because uh, it won't happen without a lot of people having a strong opinion about it. At the moment, we have federal environment laws that have been absolutely <laughs> torn to shreds in the review, the Samuels review. Um, and, you know, I've got the quote there, the Australian, you know, natural environment and iconic places are in overall state of decline uh, after de two decades of failing to continuously improve the law and its implementation. So recognising the laws are completely failing to protect biodiversity and there's been absolutely no reform. And most recently we've seen the federal government um, pulling back its progress on uh, the reform um, and indicating that we won't see the reforms promised in this term of government, which we we absolutely must have. <laughs> um we saw the community engagement review of energy um, from the, which is called the Dyer review. If you haven't read it, look it up. Um, you know, and I just sort of pulled one of the stats there. Do you believe that the community will benefit from large scale energy projects? And seventy one percent of people disagreed, and that is because industry has continuously failed to properly engage traditional owners and communities, let alone um, to ensure that there's benefit sharing to those communities or community ownership or traditional owner ownership. And so there's some really major reforms that needs to happen in that place. And then planning in Queensland, you know, in Queensland we don't have an upper house in government, so you can change laws pretty radically pretty quickly, um, but usually they're not changed for the better. Uh, we have seen a review of State Code 23, but we haven't seen the release of that um, review at the moment say code 23 for wind farms allows wind farms to be proposed and assessed without community consultation with low bar environmental assessments um, and that's why we're seeing so many developments come up and pass through assessments so quickly unless they trigger the federal environment laws there isn't community consultation and even if they do trigger the federal environment laws the federal environment laws are failing um and in all of that, we've got regional planning laws, which are also failing to deliver the visions that they describe. And so, um, and that's why I wouldn't reassure the community is because we have failing um, environmental and planning laws and community engagement practices. And so unless we work really hard to make it really clear that we have expectations for that this energy system to be different to the one we currently have, that's not just gonna magically happen. Um, we are at 
Tafnet have um, worked with a couple of other conservation groups um, to develop this vision about probably three and a half years ago now, um, which is an ambitious vision um, that requires all of the work that I just described and more, um, which is a vision that is a restorative energy industry that increases biodiversity in Queensland and empowers First Nations people and regional communities while providing affordable and reliable energy. Um, you know, that that is an ambitious um, thing and we've got a bit more detail on our website that you can check out. Um, but, you know, just to describe, you know, because I think there's a lot of greenwashing, but, um, you know, if we were to develop our renewable energy and already impacted landscapes, you know, we've got a cleared cattle grazing property, we put wind turbines on it, and then we restore the stream banks and gullies, we increase threatened species, um, you know, like habitat, uh, we increase the amount of biodiversity. What we're not talking about absolutely is, but is offsets, because offsets almost always result in net loss <laughs> overall. And, and there's so many issues with that offsets program. So what we're talking about is um, development in disrupted landscapes and improving those biodiversity um, outcomes. So how we get there is hard work from everyone and everyone having an opinion about this, which is the reform, the reform of the federal environment laws, um, the reform of our planning laws, we need, at the moment, we have regional planning that has no accountability in our planning system. There's no minister who's actually accountable to delivery of those plans. Um, there's some really exciting work done at a national level for local energy hubs, which would be, you know, having community and industry reference groups that um, developers have to come to and engage with early to 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 get um, feedback from the community about their proposals and their, um, you know, sort of ideas before it even goes into the assessments project. So we don't, uh, so assessments process, so we don't, the first thing that the community hears of is something because when it's at an EPVC, you know, assessment and we have 10 days to respond, which really isn't ideal, um, that we're focusing on distributed energy and energy efficiency and, you know, a well-planned critical minimum strategy that closes the loop. So, and that's just some top line things and all of those things are an incredible amount of work. But what can you do now? I've put some QR codes there that you can use on your phone and um, we can follow up with some links if you don't know how to use a QR code or you don't have a smartphone. Um, but basically at the moment, um, the review of state code 23 for wind farms in Queensland is sat with the um, planning minister, Megan Scanlon. She could release that and reform those um those laws and we think that needs to happen yesterday. So we are asking people to send letters to her, asking her to make sure that happens. Uh, ministers don't do things because they're morally right. They do them because people make them. <laughs> uh, so please get on there and also emailing your federal MP about the importance of the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act reforms, which you can read about on both of those links. Um, and there's sort of preset emails there, but you can go in and edit and add your opinion and your ideas and your thoughts in there. Um, and yeah, that's, I can put those details in the chat uh, and always happy to um, talk to people, but hopefully that's a reasonable amount of time.